Well, thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am very proud of my association with the Future of Freedom Foundation. Very proud that they uh, published my book. And, and Bumper, uh, you know, when I talk about the book, I very often say we. I don't mean that in any sort of editorial sense or royal sense. Uh, Bumper really was a uh, partner in this project. He conceived it. He brought it to me. He was a great source of sustenance and uh, provided that tonic a writer always needs. Because uh, any writer will know there's always a period uh, where the uh, results are less than tangible. Uh, and Bumper was always asking me where the book is. And I always said, it's in my head. <laughs> and uh, he had a way of uh, encouraging me to get it uh, from, from my head onto paper or onto the word processor. And uh, it wouldn't, as I say in, the, in my own uh, acknowledgments in the, in, the, in the beginning of the book, uh, but for him, the book would not have uh, come into being. Now, I've been trying to uh, think of a really succinct way of uh, illustrating the poor quality of education in this country. And, and I think I've come up with a way to do it. I was thinking about this all morning. Um, it seems to me that, let me just pose a question. How come there seems to be a direct correlation between the amount of education a person has in the United States and his inability to understand the words, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It, <laughs> I mean, in the great heartland where there's not a lot of fancy PhDs and postdoctorals, I mean, people understand that the right, of, you know, the right of the people means the right of the people. You know, if I can make a radical leap here. And to keep and bear arms means to keep and bear arms. <laughs> And it's, it seems like as you get more education, especially in the northeast part of the country, uh, for some reason those words turn into the states have the right to have National Guard units. I don't, there's something lost there, but uh, I don't know how that happens. Now, I wanted to start off with uh, two quotations. The first one goes this way. The popular erroneous assumption is to the effect that the aim of public education is to fill the young of the species with knowledge and awaken their intelligence, and so to make them fit to discharge the duties of citizenship in an enlightened and independent manner. Nothing could be further from the truth. The aim of public education is not to spread that in the, uh, the enlightenment at all. It is simply to reduce as many individuals as possible to the same safe level, to breed a standard citizenry, to put down dissent and originality. Now, this is not uh, something said offhand at a cocktail party by Bumper Hornberger recently. He could, he could have, but it, he didn't. Um, this, was, in fact, was spoken in the 1920s, written in the 1920s by H.L. Mencken, great, uh, I think, uh, forefather of ours here. Uh, and I bring this uh, quotation to your attention just to let you know that uh, the things we complain about regarding the government schools is nothing uh, terribly new. It's not something that began in the 60s or 70s, but something Mencken saw back in the 20s and the 30s. Now, the next quotation I'll, is another little quiz. Uh, it's who said this, and, and those of you who know the answer, don't shout it out and give it away to the people that uh, may, maybe have not come in contact with this quotation before. Uh, I will give you a hint. Again, it's not Bumper Hornberger, although, again, he could have said this. It's time to admit that public education operates like a planned economy, a bureaucratic system in which everybody's role is spelled out in advance, and there are few incentives for innovation and productivity. It's no surprise that our school system doesn't improve. It more resembles the communist economy than our own market economy. Well, that was not spoken by uh, anybody who has ever called himself a libertarian or a classical liberal or a market liberal or even a friend of liberty. That word, those words are spoken by Albert Shanker, president of the American Federation of Teachers. Um, the amazing thing is in the next sentence, I don't know what the next sentence was exactly, but I know for one thing, he didn't advocate separation of school and state. Although you'd think, how could you possibly say something, anything other than that after you've said this? I mean, this is an amazing insight. Uh, he knows much more than he realizes he knows, uh, which is, rela relates to a point I'm going to make about knowledge in, in a moment. Well, I think it's safe to say that dissatisfaction with the uh, government schools, uh, I may slip once in a while and call them gov uh, public schools. Uh, forgive me for that. Uh, as far as I know, all schools are public. I mean, they, they, they draw their students from the public, from society. Uh, it's like a restaurant is public, and somehow we, uh, this word has gotten twisted over the years to mean government. So I might slip, but I mean government if I say public schools. Uh, dissatisfaction with those schools. Uh, it's funny, they're neither public nor not schools. <laughs> Orwell, Orwell was right. Orwell was right. 
Uh, but dissatisfaction with whatever they are is at an all-time high. Complaints are everywhere, ubiquitous. They're uh, in the papers, on TV, and radio news all, all the time. Uh, sim uh, symptoms of this are the bitter fights that are occurring in school districts and, uh, all over the country where people are uh, uh, par irate parents, don't like what children are being taught, and, uh, and uh, cultural uh, things that are uh, now part of the curriculum, whether it's condoms, whether it's a prayer, whatever it is, the bitter fights are going on where people are pitted against each other uh, in a, in a very uh, uh, unfortunate way. Scores, of course, uh, fall or at best stagnate. Um, colleges and corporations are engaged in remedial, putting on remedial courses to, the, to an extent they've never had to do that before. I mean, companies have to basically teach uh, new recruits how to read uh, because they, they, you know, they can't read. And the recent reports in the paper of a few weeks ago about uh, reading proficiency, very low. Uh, there was a study out of, uh, out of uh, Senator uh, Edward, Ted Kennedy's office a few years ago showing that while uh, the literacy rate in uh, Massachusetts around the time of this study was uh, said to be about 91 percent, that's probably overstating it, uh, they, con they conceded in their study that in 1830, before there were public schools, the literacy rate was 98 percent. So it seems like it was downhill. <laughs> I wouldn't call that progress. And of course, we've, we've also defined literacy down. We've, have to we've had to introduce the term functional illiteracy. It used to mean literacy meant you could read. Now people can read, but of course they can't function by way of the written word, so we've needed a new term. You know, reading used to mean you also understood. Now reading means you can pronounce the words, doesn't necessarily mean you understand. So now, so to remedy that, we've needed functional literacy. You see how we're always, um, you know, there's always this uh, back and filling. You notice what's going on? Uh, did you read the other day? Uh, two weeks ago, the story in the Washington Post about a, a, a District of Columbia girl who scored 1,600, perfect score on the SATs. A week later, there's a story about how the SATs, the SAT now adds 100 points to everybody's score, uh, and you can get four wrong and still have a perfect score. Uh, and they, every year, they redefine. They add points so that the average will always be 500. So now you can't tell from year to year what the heck's going on. You know, how you compare, it can mean anything. Uh, so someone who has, uh, you know, a relatively low score and someone who has a perfect score could actually end up in the same uh, quintile. I mean, it's, uh, they're all constantly covering up what's, uh, what's really going on. But I don't think it's working. I think people uh, are understanding this. Well, what's the problem? The problem is government, okay? You all knew that. You didn't need to come here to hear me, uh, hear me say that, did you? But that is the problem, and I'll spell out a, a few reasons why it is the problem. I and mean, uh, when you think about it, uh, government school, I owe this point to Marshall Fritz, who's doing great work on the separation of school and state. Uh, government, is, uh, government schools were really the first welfare program in the United States, if you think about it. Predates Social Security, predates, uh, you know, uh, sort of what we think of as welfare. But it was supposed to be free, a free universal service to everybody, given it to everybody. It's even means tested, right? Every, everybody got it. And of course, the outcome has been just what we would expect from a, uh, from a government-provided uh, service. Uh, mediocre, one-size-fits-all, deterioration, uh, all those things that we come to associate with government for a very good reason. Um, look at the promises that were made when, when uh, free universal education, what used to be called the common school in the 19th century, was uh, first being talked about. It promised, first of all, lit a literate uh, public, uh, law-abiding young people, uh, uh, instilling a national culture, all kinds of good things. Instead, what we've gotten is, uh, like I told you, uh, illiteracy, um, a growing underclass, um, lawlessness uh, among this underclass, and, and a, a continuing cultural balkanization. I mean, th their whole promise was to bring a national culture. Um, and instead, what we're getting is this fragmentation where everybody's uh, fighting everybody else over group rights, pe you know, national rights within the, within the country. And um, it's, it's on the exact, exact opposite of what, of what they promised. On the other hand, I'll argue a little later that, in, in fact, the schools, at one other level, the schools are actually working. They're actually doing what they, what they promised, which was to, to um, aside from the underclass, which, has, which they bas basically have written off, the, the schools are fairly good at turning out fairly compliant uh, taxpayers quiescent taxpayers who, who listen to the government. Which prompted another thought, and I think my talk actually builds on uh, gyms in some, in some uh, ways. Because I think what happens is, it occurred to me as he was speaking that Waco and Ruby Ridge and some of these other examples uh, are, what, are what you get when 
public schooling doesn't take. Okay, you see what I mean? The, the children of uh, Waco weren't going to public schools, I assume. I, pretty, I guess they were homeschooled at the, at the uh, Davidian uh, uh, place. And um, I imagine uh, Randy Weaver's kids didn't go to public school. Um, so if, if this is what happens when kids escape the public schools or if they go and it doesn't take, we end up with a confrontation because the point of the schools is to turn out good citizens who don't question the government. I mean, that's, that's basically what it comes down to. Uh, sure, they needed to be able to read, and they, they're not very good at that because they want to be able to staff industry and the military, the civil service, so they, they need uh, people who can read. So they want some things. Uh, do, they want you to be able to do some arithmetic. But what they really want is a good, quiet rank and file of citizenry who will uh, um, pay the proper homage to government. And the, the way to see this is in the way history is taught. Uh, you ever notice how in the, in the history lessons that you learn in school, it's always private activity that's causing great damage and destruction and government on the white uh, stallion riding to the rescue and saving us. What, the Industrial Revolution, we needed to be saved from that by enlightened government. Okay, the robber barons at the turn of the century, monopolizing everything, ravaging the consumer, ravaging workers. The trust busters had to ride to the, uh, the rescue on the white steed and save us. Uh, capitalism gave us the depression. Franklin Roosevelt on the white steed, or as Mencken called him, Roosevelt II, rides on the white steed, uh, again, saves us. Uh, time after time, the wars are interpreted that way. World War II, what was World War II? It's the last thing they have these days, the status. It's the card they have to play every time now. They saved us from Hitler. Okay? You can say what you want about government, but we saved you from Hitler. And they're going to just play this until from time immemorial. And, you know, forever, they're going to be saying this, because it's, it's like the last thing they have now. People are seeing through so much of it. Uh, that's why the celebration over the 50th anniversary was... Um, is played up so much, so much that uh, you know Clinton does uh, does an obscene thing like go to Moscow uh, to celebrate the end of World War II. Um, we saved Poland from Hitler so we could deliver it to Stalin. Okay, <laughs> that's what we celebrated. Great. All right, figure that one out. Uh, when you figure that one out, tell me because I can't figure it out. Um, what the schools have been and what they had to be from the beginning, government schools, is the laboratory for the social engineers. Okay, that's what they are. What else could they be? Uh, I mean, look at it, and I don't even need to ascribe bad motives here, because that's not the point. Assume good motives. Assume they're benevolent people. They, they think they're actually doing good for people. Uh, that may not be true in every case, but I'm willing to accept that for the sake of argument. If you were a part of the, let's call the ruling elite, okay, this, this uh, in any society, political society, a smaller group emerges that, that sees themselves as the, as the benevolent governors. Okay, so if you're in that position, and you, and you believe what you're doing is good for the nation, that this is important for the nation and for the society, you're going to want to set up a system to train the younger generation to properly respect this system. And to, to do that, you need to also justify the past to the younger generation. After all, all younger generations are come up questioning. That's the nature of the younger generation. And so you need to put them through, you'll want to put them through a mill so that their rebelliousness and rambunctiousness can be properly molded so that they have the proper respect toward the ruling elite. And I think this, is, this will happen in a democracy as well as in an authoritarian uh, or, you know, uh, autocracy. I don't think it, it, it matters. It's what Walter Lippmann called in the 1920s the manufacture of consent. Okay, no matter how good, well-meaning this, this group of governors are, they're gonna feel that they need to manufacture consent. They need the support. They, it, it, Things won't go very smoothly if there's constantly dissent. If people are constantly pointing a finger at the government saying, this is not good, this is not good, you're, you know, you're bothering us, you're violating our freedom. I mean, you can't, it's hard, it's too disruptive. You need basically people nodding their heads saying, yes, you know, whatever you say. Uh, and it's good if you can get them young. It's too, you don't want to wait until it's too, it's too late. You get them young. How do you get them young? You get them into school, government schools early. And not only you teach, okay, yes, you teach them to read, you teach them to uh, write, to arith arithmetic, but you teach them social studies and a, and, a, and a view of history that is most conducive to this purpose. It's a form of social engineering. Again, even if you don't assume any bad, nefarious motives, okay? I, I think that's really uh, a secondary consideration. <clears throat> so that's how schools have always been used. If you go back to Sparta, where I really, I guess you find the first uh, public school system, that's exactly what it was to do. It was to staff the military. This was a militaristic authoritarian society. And it was to make sure there wasn't any widespread dissent. You see it next in uh, Germany with when Luther sets up schools in the 16th century. 
in a couple of the uh, states and cities of, uh, of Germany. Uh, again, it's to impose a rigid dogmatic view, uh, Lutheranism, and no heresy is allowed. He says it, he will brook no dissent. The thing, you don't uh, argue with heretics, they should be dismissed unheard, as he put it. John Calvin does the same thing in Geneva. Frederick William does it in Prussia in 1717. Again, this is a very authoritarian environment. Frederick William used to beat his subjects yelling, why don't you love me? Okay. <laughs> this is the guy that gives us the first modern public school system. <laughs> and this is what teachers and administrators do metaphorically. Uh, not all of them, they're good, they're good teachers out there, and I don't mean to uh, say all, everybody who teaches in the public school, there are a couple of people here, who teaches in the public schools are, uh, are bad people. Uh, and, and again, you can separate this from, from motive. It's a systemic thing, that's what I really want to get out of systemic. Uh, in Prussia, in the early 19th century, uh, Germany th suffers a terrible defeat at the hands of Napoleon, and it's a devastating, it's a devastating, uh, has a devastating psychological effect on the uh, German nation, particularly the German uh, government, and they, they reinforce their public school system as a way of coming back from this defeat, instilling a new sense of patriotism, and, the, and again, the whole point is to instill a particular mindset in uh, young people. Again, it's a, it's a labor, it was always been a laboratory for social engineers. Now, Richard Ebeling covered some, a, a bit of my ground uh, in his talk because he, he talked about how American intellectuals studied uh, Bismarck's uh, uh, welfare state, brought the ideas back, the various programs back. Actually, a little earlier than that, in the 1830s, a group of intellectuals led by Horace Mann of Massachusetts, the first commissioner of education of Massachusetts, goes to visit the public school system, study the public school system in uh, Germany, and they bring a blueprint back in order to get it adopted by the states, the various states of, in the United States. Uh, luckily, the Constitution was still seen uh, as a document that uh, more or less meant what it said back then, and it was, there was widespread belief that the federal government did not have a role in education. Of course, the Constitution does not give any role to the uh, federal government in uh, I should call it the national government in, uh, in education. And so man was operating in that milieu, and so the, the, the common school movement had to operate at the state level. They, they didn't have the federal level available to, at that time, uh, I'm sure to their dismay. It would have made their work much easier. Instead, it took about 50, 60 years for them to get every state in the union to adopt uh, government schools. But the point is they brought the Prussian system over. They tried, they were, their, their goal was to instill a national culture Again, to interfere with the spontaneity of, uh, of, uh, of, of culture and, and, and society when it's left alone, when people are left free, those things spontaneously develop. They didn't like the spontaneous development. They didn't, uh, they were they didn't like that it was uncertain, the direction was uncertain, the speed uh, of development was uncertain. They wanted to drive it, steer it and drive it. Uh, they also brought over some very particular aspects of government education, which still are with us today in, in government schools and even have, of course, been adopted long ago by private schools because it became, it became part of the idea of school. Those things included isolating students from normal life, okay? Insti the institutionalization of young people. That's what school is. It takes them out of normal life and puts them in, in a very artificial uh, environment. They're sitting around with people only of their own age. Where else in life does that occur, okay? Do we only have people of one age in here? It's ridiculous. We, we, you wouldn't organize a conference of just people of uh, one age. Okay, f only fifth graders can come to this. Uh, <laughs> it, doesn't it doesn't make sense. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's stifling. Um, the fragmentation of subjects was another thing that the Prussian system did. Fragmenting subjects and then teaching it in sort of 45-minute uh, blocks of time. So, and then when the, that period's over, bell rings, you do something else. No matter how much you're interested in the thing you were doing, sorry, bell rang, now we're doing this. But I want to do this, sorry, the bell rang. We're doing this now. <laughs> it's like Pavlov, right? <laughs> Bing, okay, I go from math to English. This is all innovated, uh, innovation from the uh, public school system uh, of Prussia. The fragmentation of subjects, uh, the isolation of students, the, uh, the, the inst instilling in, in children the importance of obedience and memorization. So much was, a, was memorization, not so much understanding, but drill, 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 memorize. And finally, and these are identified, by the way, by John Taylor Gatto, a great commentator on schools, New York City, New York State Teacher of the Year in 1990, 
uh, turned around in accepting the award at the state senate in Albany, renounces schools, <laughs> calls them Prussian authoritarian institutions. And, the, and the, last, the last element he identified as part of the Prussian system was teaching children, not, not so much outright, not using these words, but just it's just implicit, it's by, almost by osmosis, that the true parent of the child is what? The state. The state. And this ties into my next point. I was amazed in researching this book. I mean, I knew, and this is something I didn't mention, I should mention first, part of this idea of creating the national culture was the fear of immigrants. Because at this time you had Catholic immigrants, Irish Catholic immigrants coming in, and there was a great fear that this was going to be disruptive. They weren't enlightened like the, uh, the, the Protestants were. And the whole idea was to, as they put it, Christianize the Catholics. Okay. The, textbooks, the textbooks were openly anti-Catholic. They used terms like popery. Okay, that's not a compliment. Okay. They used terms like deceitful Catholics. That's not a compliment. The Catholics at this time begin to set up their own school systems. Guess why? They feel a bit alienated by the system. Uh, and they riot in New York and Philadelphia when uh, they make a mistake here. They try to get public money, government money, for their systems. They say, hey, we have to pay taxes for your system. We should, we should get some of that money. And when the, when the uh, ruler said, said no, the officer said no, they, uh, there were some, actually some riots. So they were upset about this. But, the, but, but protecting us from the Catholics was not the only reason they wanted to set up the, the common school. Uh, they were open, and, and Richard mentioned this, they weren't just anti-Catholic, they were anti-parent, and not just Catholic parents. There was this fear that the parents were, were sort of the old school, they were lost, that was the lost generation, we couldn't do much with them, but we could certainly mold the children, but we needed to do one thing. We had to get the children away from the parents as much as possible. Now, maybe the tenor of American society being somewhat still quite libertarian, and proudly rambunctious and because the revolution wasn't that long before, um, would not have put up with uh, uh, boarding school for all kids. In other words, state schools that actually took the kids 24 hours a day. Okay? Parents, I'm sure, would not have stood for that. So they did the next best thing. They, they set up school systems which were designed to get the kids away from the parents as much as possible. And let me read some quotations. I, I, I just want to document what their attitude was. Uh, and this goes back well before man. It goes back to the, the very early national period. Uh, there's a signer of the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Rush, who is a, in my view, one of the real bad guys in this area. He's also considered the father of American psychiatry. If you want to read his views on psychiatry, see the books of Dr. Thomas Zaz. Okay. Uh, uh, Benjamin Rush is the one who discovered the disease that makes black people black. Okay. Gives you an idea what I thought about that. But here's what he had to say about Here's what he had to say about education and parents and families and all this. Society owes a great deal of its order and happiness to the deficiencies of parental government being supplied by those habits of obedience and subordination which are contracted at schools. It's, he writes it in a sort of convoluted way, but his point is the parents are deficient and the, it's the schools, the state schools, that save the children from that. This, is, this quote is almost chilling. Let our pupil be taught that he does not belong to himself but that he is public property. Let him, this, is, this guy signed the Declaration of Independence. Let him be taught to love his family, but let him be taught at the same time that he must forsake and even forget them when the welfare of his country requires it. Uh, in 1816, Archibald Murphy, a founder of the North Carolina Public Schools. By the way, the, 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 um, this, is, this is an early experiment in public schools. The South then I think uh, gets rid of them and they don't come back again until the progressive era. But 1816 where there's some uh, local public schools. Archibald Murphy, in these schools the precept of morality and religion should be inculcated and habits of subordination and obedience be formed. Their parents know not how to instruct them. The state in the warmth of her affection and solicitude for their welfare must take charge of the, you're not taking this seriously. <laughs> must take charge of those children and place them in school where their minds can be enlightened and their hearts trained to virtue. Calvin Stowe, a 19th century educationist, if a, if a regard to the public safety makes it right for a government to compel the citizens to do military duty when the country is invaded, the same reason authorizes the government to compel them to provide for the education of their children, for no foes are so much to be dreaded as ignorance and vice. If they, if they stay with the parents, they're going to learn vice. They're going to learn to drink. They may, they may even learn to gamble. 
A man has no more right to endanger the state by throwing upon it a family of ignorant and vicious children than he has to give admission to the spies of an invading army. If he is unwilling to educate his children, the state should assist him. If, if unwilling, it should compel him. Horace Mann, he is my favorite, Horace Mann. Horace Mann who said, children are wax. Okay. He, we, we who are engaged in the sacred cause of education are entitled to look upon all parents as having given hostages to our cause. They're very blunt. This was in the days before public relations. Okay. <laughs> public relations is a science, quote, science or craft or art that comes in at the progressive era. They need to clean up the rhetoric. People didn't like this kind of talk. Your children are wax and let us get it. Here's my favorite. Where is it? I have it here. The school's task is to gather little, little plastic lumps of human dough from the private households and shape them on the social kneading board. <laughs> you see, in the, the progressive era is an extremely important turning point in the country, uh, as Richard pointed out. And, and one reason it is, another, let me put a slightly different angle on it, totally consistent with what he says, just a slightly different gloss. It was the era of deference to experts, things that people had capably handled in their private lives, teaching their children morality, teaching them to read and write, and all this stuff, totally within the scope of any reasonably you know, uh, intelligent person, nor, nor, biologically normal person, suddenly became something that you couldn't understand. You needed to have a PhD, another import from Germany. There were no PhDs before they, they, they learned about them in Germany. You needed to be an expert. You couldn't educate your kids at home anymore. Education is something that's much, it's beyond the scope of someone who doesn't have special training. And once you understand this, you can understand a lot that's happened in education uh, since then. The whole education industry, education bureaucracy, is an attempt to mystify this. Mystify something that was within people's grasp, you know, for centuries. But all of a sudden now, it's too complicated for you. So who makes all the big decisions about your child's education these days? The government does. They tell, they tell you what school the kid goes to. Okay, you could buy a house in a particular area saying, I kind of like that school, and the day after that, they could change the lines, right? Districts can redraw the lines, and you're out of luck. Who, who decides what's the, what the curriculum is? You don't. Oh, sure, you can go to a meeting and shout at a board meeting, or you could say, I'm going to try to get you guys voted out of office. Oh, great, there's a, there's a lot of accountability, a lot of power to the individual. Go out and vote out a, a school board. Uh, you know, if you don't like the shoes... The, the, the shoe store down the, the, sold you down the street, um, and even if you want, let's say he won't give you your money back, you don't have to go get 51% of the community to vote the guy out of his store, do you? You just say, I'm not coming here anymore. That's it. That's the last penny you get from me. Not, not with schools. With schools, you've got to you go out and you've got to raise money and you've got to have a campaign to try to vote out, you know, John, John Doe. Well, not John Doe. He's, <laughs> he's, on, he's on the lam somewhere. <laughs> but see, with... So, so, right, you can go in, you can shout, you can complain, but who gets to make the decision? <coughs> the government people do, even if, even if they're elected. See, it doesn't matter that they're elected. It doesn't even matter what their, their uh, intentions are again. They may be, again, uh, well-intentioned people. It's systemic. Besides, those boards are the captive of the professional educrats anyway. The superintendent, who's from out of this industry, the teacher's union, and, and all of that. Even the PTA is a basically a captive of the teacher's union. <coughs> So, uh, even if the schools did not have this uh, bad genesis, you know, having its beginning in authoritarian uh, Russia, uh, Prussia, you can, uh, and Sparta, um, there are serious problems with the idea anyway. Let's say they were homegrown. Let's say it was a 100% uh, American-made uh, idea. Okay, nobody studied any other country. Uh, that's not the end of the story, because. As we know from the Austrian commentary on the problems, the, the innate problem of socialism, government schools, as Schenker said, and this is why I, I mentioned that about Schenker, he, he knows more than he realizes he knows. Uh, there's a systemic ignorance in government, a government education system for the same reason that, uh, that a socialism can't work. The same kind of denial of knowledge that occurs in socialism occurs in on a smaller scale uh, in a government uh, school system. Because 
the, per the point is, as, again, as Richard pointed out, the market, the discovery process, uh, teaches us things that we wouldn't learn otherwise. The free functioning of the price system, through that, through the rivalry, we learn things we, we can't know otherwise. The same thing is true of education. The best ideas about education, I mean, we know a lot of things about education already. I mean, there's very successful homeschooling families all over the country. Somebody knows something about how, how to uh, nurture the curio natural curiosity of children. But there may be, there's still things to learn. You can never say we know everything there is to know about a subject. Um, the way you get that is by many people trying many things at the same time without having to get somebody's permission. But if the school district is the one in charge of the curriculum, and if they can make sure most kids go there because you've got to pay your taxes even if you use uh, private, if you go to private school, the, the district has a monopoly or is claiming a monopoly on wisdom. They're claiming to know what, how, how good schools should be run because they get to say what gets into the system and what doesn't get into the system. Now they may say, oh no, we don't think we have a monopoly on uh, wisdom. We're willing to listen to new ideas. Bring forth your ideas. We don't claim to know everything. We want to hear from people. But that's a, that's not, that's a ruse because get who, who gets to pick which idea that's brought before them gets chosen and which gets rejected? The same people who are claiming they don't have a monopoly on wisdom. In other words, they are claiming a monopoly on wisdom. They're claiming to, to they, they know what a good idea is when they see it. And so they should be the ones to say which gets tried and which doesn't get tried. Instead of just letting people going out and trying them and seeing how other potential clients, parents, children respond, whether they want to accept them, whether they want to give them a try. And of course, in a market, the moment they decide they don't like the idea, they take their business somewhere else. That's what we don't get. And so there's a systemic ignorance in government education. And I think there's a sweet justice in that, that government education is systemically ignorant, systemically stupid. There's nothing it could do about it. It's like trying to make a square you know, into a circle. You can't do it uh, because it's bureaucracy. Government is bureaucracy. That's how bureaucracy delivers services. It's got captive money. It's got captive clients. And so it doesn't, need, it doesn't have the discovery process, and it doesn't need to be responsive. Uh, what we need is entrepreneurship. Th that's the discovery procedure. Uh, Kersner draws a distinction between the, what he calls the open-ended universe and the closed-ended universe. The, the closed-ended universe wor or world uh, describes really how the government schools operate. The decision makers really know everything there is to know. Now it's just a matter of calculating what's the best alternative to choose. But they see all the alternatives in front of them. They just now need to do some calculations on the, on the, on the machine and the, then they choose the right one. Uh, but that's not the way the world works. Because the world is open-ended. We don't see all the alternatives immediately. There's what Kersner calls the, the possibility of utter surprise, okay? It's not just that there's not something, it's not just that you don't know things and, and you know what you're ignorant of. Let me give you an example. I mean, I'm ignorant of the population of uh, Tanzania. But I know I'm ignorant of it and I know I, where to find it. The day, I, the day it's worth the cost to me to find that information, if I need to know for some reason, I know I'll do it. And I know how to find it out. I'll go to the library or something, I'll call the embassy of Tanzania. Okay, but there's some things, not only am I ignorant of, I'm ignorant of the fact that I'm ignorant of it. Okay, for instance, if I, if, you know, I, I can't give you an example. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can give you a hypothetical example. If I never heard of Tanzania, I, did, I wouldn't know I was ignorant of the population of Tanzania. Okay, there's a hypothetical example. Okay, that, it's, it's the utter ignorance which makes possible utter surprise and, and discovery. And that's why we need entrepreneurship. If, it was, if the only ignorance was so-called rational ignorance, in other words, you know what you don't know and could find it out the day it's worthwhile to you, then the world would be very different. But in a world of utter ignorance and the possibility of, utter, of, of surprise and discovery, you need, if we, if we were to do well for ourselves, if we were to prosper, we need entrepreneurship. That's what entrepreneurship does. It, it's people out there looking for this utter surprise and discovery. And what motivates them, of course, is the prospect of profit. And we need that in education. We don't have that in education because the government dominates it so much. Um, I want to leave time for comments and questions, so I'm going to conclude, first of all, on one note. You know, for years and years and years, centuries, in, Europe was torn by religious warfare, vicious wars. Not always open warfare, but then persecution and all kinds of things. Then someone got a bright idea. I think it first maybe germinates in Holland. Let's take religion out of 
politics, out of the political sphere. Let's stop fighting. Think of how rich we could be if we just stop fighting about this. You go to your church or synagogue or mosque or whatever it is, and I'll go to mine, and it's like live and let live, and, and I don't care and you don't care. But meanwhile, let's produce and make money. Let's separate church and state. And, you know, they tried that, and, and Holland started to get rich. And England saw that, and they, and they even though they maintained the state church, they, they pretty much took it out of uh, uh, the public realm. I mean, they didn't jam, uh, as the Industrial Revolution comes along, they don't jam uh, religion down people's throats. And they start to get rich. And then the U.S. formalizes it in the First Amendment. And, and of course, we see then the greatest uh, production of wealth ever. The reason we called the book Separating School and State is because we wanted to draw the parallel between education and religion. They're very closely related. Education deals with people's deepest views of the world and their values. So does religion. There's a great overlap there. And it, the threat of forcing your religion on someone else is very similar to the threat of forcing your, religious, your educational views on somebody else. And the way you take the bitterness and rancor out of this is to stop threatening forcing your ideas about education on somebody else. But when they're government schools, that's what it means. If you go and fight at a school district meeting, everybody knows that if my side loses, their side's going to force something on my kids. And so it's very, very bitter and disruptive and divisive. We need to take that out of the public realm, the government realm, for the same reason we took religion out of the government realm, and let there be social peace over this. Uh, I want to close with a quotation from a, gr a great man who I urge you to read, Richard Mitchell, all, all, otherwise known as the underground grammarian. It is only from a special point of view that education is a failure. As to its own purposes, it is an unqualified success. One of its purposes is to serve as a massive tax-supported job program for legions of not especially able or talented people. As social programs go, it's a good one. The pay isn't high, but the risk is low. The standards are lenient, entry is easy, and job security is still pretty good. In fact, the system is perfect, except for one little detail. We must find a way to get the children out of it. Thank you. <laughs>